Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Let's get straight into it. The World <laughs> Cup. It's probably the most converging event globally, probably even more so than the Olympics. How has this translated in the kind of experience that you're designing and curating for later this year? So the World Cup is obviously a very exciting moment for Qatar and the Arab world. Qatar bid for the World Cup to bring it to the Arab world. We initiated a Years of Culture program when we first won the World Cup in 2010. And this year, it's the year of Minasa to celebrate the diversity of cultures in the Arab world and um, to really focus on culture, uh, to make it as important as the sports uh, event itself. So the beauty about Qatar, it's a compact country and people who can attend the games and go to the stadiums can actually visit all of our exhibitions. Uh, so we're very excited. There are very interesting exhibitions about the Arab world that we're showing for the very first time. And I would love to share that with the audience whenever it's appropriate. Well, well give us some of the highlights. Wh which ones excite you the most? I know there are a lot. So wh what would you say was, was extra special to your heart? It's like asking who's your favorite <laughs> child. Um, actually, they're all equally exciting and important because it showcases different cultures from different parts of the world. We're, sh we're installing 80 new public artworks. I'm sure all of you came through Hamad International Airport and seen the Earth Fisher Yellow Bear that's become so iconic to Qatar itself. Uh, we have an amazing exhibition in partnership with the Baghdad uh, Museum as well as other museums in Europe and the US. It's talking about the 500 years of the Abbasid Empire when Baghdad was the capital of the Islamic world. Uh, we have the reopening of the Islamic Art Museum with works that have never been seen before. Um, we have an exhibition on our future museum, Lucille Museum, that talks about Orientalist paintings and, and, and design uh, with objects that only Qatar has, talking about the region and the world. We are introducing our future modern and contemporary art museum with art mill, our current flower mill. We're doing an exhibition on Al Jazeera, 25 years of Al Jazeera, which is super exciting for us as it's uh, really put Qatar on the map 25 years ago, as well as an exhibition with the Palestinian uh, Museum Labor of Love, talking about textiles at the Katara Culture Village. Um, we have our sports museum, which you've all seen the video with Zayn uh, visiting as one of our first visitors when we opened in the spring of this year. We're having an exhibition of the world of football opening uh, at the sports museum that talks about uh, Arab football players who've represented other nations around the world. We also have a few exciting exhibition at Methaf, uh, the artists in residence exhibition of artists who've gone through the fire station program as well as an exhibition by Sophia al Merri and uh, a Lebanese artist. And what else do we have? Um, <laughs> I don't think I think, I think, I think that. <laughs> <laughs> that's really tremendous. Oh, Everything I forgot. Actually, we have the Valentino exhibition that we're oh, doing yeah. for the very first time, which <laughs> I think the audience, I see a lot of women in the room. You love that show. <laughs> well, it goes without saying. Uh, that you really are front and center in building experiences and creative and cultural ecosystems in, uh, in Qatar, in the region, and it has a powerful impact throughout the rest of the world. Just give us a sense of how you've cultivated some of your core principles and your own personal goals around the World Cup, but in the creative space in general. So Qatar has a national vision 2030, and we've created a 25-year plan that fits perfectly in that vision of developing um, the human capacities that we have in Qatar, but also in the region. So it's a really exciting moment because it's, uh, you know, you'll see these exhibitions and you'll assume that they've been planned last month, but it has been a 10-year in the planning and the making of how do we introduce the world to Qatar in a very authentic way. People do not want to go to countries and see the same thing everywhere they go. They want to, they want to visit uh, unique experiences, and that's exactly how we've offered it during the World Cup. The exhibitions actually will open before the World Cup and continue on until the, uh, the end of March, beginning of April. So those who didn't come to Qatar during the World Cup still have the chance to, to visit these exhibitions and learn about the Arab world, its diversity, um, and so forth. So 
I was just in Athens for another conference and it was very interesting to hear what they're doing because it's very much similar to how we're perceiving culture and authenticity. One of the things that uh, people will also be experiencing this year is activation of heritage sites. One uh, particular project that I'm very excited about is Ain Muhammad because the people who are activating that village are actually descendants of the original families and tribes who lived there many uh, centuries ago. And just across from there, we'll have a new installation in the desert. I'm going to announce it to the audience. It's Oliver Elison, his first major installation here. And that will then follow with an exhibition of Oliver Elison in Doha next March uh, at the National Museum. You talked about authenticity. How do you personally use the, the notion of authenticity to drive some of the work that you do? What is it that you think about when you come into the office every day and you're looking at all the exhibitions that you have in front of you? You want to have a, a personal sense of how you see it. Yes, that's a very good question. The, the people, you know, we look at the people that are living here, the representations that we have, and we really engage with our creatives that are living here, whether they're filmmakers, artists, craftsmen, uh, filmmakers, and that's how the story unfolds. You know, we depend very much on the organic growth of our uh, culture and society. And I can give you the National Museum as an example. You know, people have only complimented the National Museum since we've opened, but pr previous to that, we were always, um, we always got negative press for the delay of the opening of the National Museum, but the reality is we wanted to create something authentic, and the only way to do that was to engage all the stakeholders in the community. So we ran multiple workshops on different themes and different topics, and we got all the information collected, and you only see actually part of that. Uh, the rest of it is in our digital database that we make accessible for researchers and curators to create new narratives and exhibitions moving forward. The, the National Museum, actually, that's one of the exhibitions I forgot to mention, currently has an exhibition on our future car museum, as well as a Pipilotti wrist installation. And for the World Cup, we're opening an exhibition on nomadic tents, uh, because we're very proud of our past, and it connects the region of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And that's uh, going to be a highlight of our, of our program. One of the things that you've been working on is how to integrate technology into your work and, and making it really synonymous and working almost like a symphony with the creative and cultural space. What are the most important results that you've embraced from the collision of, of technology with art and authentic spaces? Well, the National Museum is a really good example of that. When we had the building, we realized the walls were very complicated. There were no straight walls inside the museum. So we combine technology with the artifacts and the storytelling, using the, the walls to project films, but also understanding how the visitor can pass through and not be disturbed by the films that, um, that will continue on in the galleries. The sports museum is also a good example. We've actually borrowed many objects from around the world for the museum, whether it's from the US or Europe or other parts of, the, of Asia and we use technology to connect with the audiences and engage with them. The future um, Children's Museum will also have technology. We've also partnered, I mean, Oridu is a major partner. We're very grateful for all of the work that they've done with us. They've been a strategic partner. Uh, at the Jeff Koons, we had a collaboration with Oridu and Snapchat, where you could have a Jeff Koons in your living room. And we're looking at other collaborations at the moment with the upcoming exhibitions that we're doing. Um, you know, many people have come to us for the metaverse and the NFTs, and obviously these are conversations that we're continuing to have. One of the things I think, uh, Your Excellency, that's important to highlight and also speak to is the fact that all of these exhibitions and all of the, the efforts that you're making in the creative and cultural industries are really important drivers uh, and have enormous potential for economic growth. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yes, yeah, so um, in everything that we do in all of our projects, we really try to incorporate the creative economy as elements of our initiatives. M7 is an incubation between Qatar Development Bank and the Qatar Museums to support entrepreneurs. Last week, a, a, a private sector company called From took two Qatari designers and produced furniture, and now they'll have a permanent um, showroom in Milan. 
Uh, uh, last week, we launched the World Cup poster. It's a Qatari designer who have done significantly well with her art. Now she's represented in collections around the world in major museums. In our national museum, we have a Desert Rose Cafe. If you haven't been, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it is authentic Qatari food, a chef that has, that's multi-talented, and she was trained under Alain Ducasse for um, how to present the meals and uh, package the the you know the dishes in a in a you know I don't know how to describe it, but in a different way, so um, those are examples that I can think of. But also public art, like uh, two weeks ago, Shaw Gilmana installed the, a a new installation of the Arabic agal that all the men here are wearing. It's a black piece, and you know she was an artist that we discovered or we discovered on Instagram. Sorry. Um, during the blockade, and she was a she had she was a very patriotic artist, and she created amazing paintings. And so, for the very first time, her paintings are now translated in sculpture. And we have here Dr. Abdullah, who's um, who's a big supporter of the museums, but also a gallerist, and he's supported and incubated many of the artists in residence in his galleries. We have other dealers today, Al Hosh Gallery being another active uh, gallerist in Qatar supporting a lot of the young designers, but also innovating. You know, at the Doha jewelry exhibition last month, you had so many jewelry designers, but collaborating with artists. And I've, I saw a lot of people buy their, their, their things. And so, you know, it is gr growing gradually, but in every industry, if you want film, if you want fashion, we have the platforms to support them and the museums and the collections to inspire them. So Qatar becomes a very attractive hub. What's your biggest challenge? <laughs> I have so many. Um, my biggest challenge. Sorry. Um, so I think our biggest challenge was, it, I don't think it's as big of a challenge today as it was, but for people to understand and realize that culture is not a hobbyist um, job. You know, a lot of the artists that we initially supported had to have a full-time job to support themselves. Today that has changed. A lot of these artists, by becoming successful, whether it's in film, fashion, design, have been able to stand on, on their own feet thanks to the support of all of the different partners that are here. So I think that was a challenge initially because culture or museums in the past have been, was, were, was looked at as a form of entertainment. In actual fact, it's a key component for knowledge, uh, for knowledge-based economy. Teachers, we've been training teachers on how to use the museum to teach the various subjects that they're required to teach in schools, uh, and to align the skills that children need today for their future professions. So that was a challenge initially, but to be honest, whenever we explain what we're doing and how we're doing it, the reception we've been getting has been very, very positive. I'd like to draw your attention to focus a little more in the African space, which I know that you're quite active. The, the African creative and cultural space is becoming more relevant and is much more of an important contribution to the global conversation today. But Africa and African talent still lag in access, uh, in support, in funding, and even in mind, in mind share. What are your thoughts of possible activities that uh, could occur to be able to support the African creative and cultural industry? So we've been working with African designers and artists. We did an amazing exhibition at Methaf uh, two years ago of Elena Tsui. Um, and last year we had a Virgil Abloh show, an artist from uh, Ghana who designed for Off-White and LV Men. Unfortunately, after his show, he passed away. Uh, and in the fall of this year, we have a big gala dinner with Naomi Campbell, Fashion for Relief, and it will be supporting the creative economy in Africa. Now, I know very little about Africa, but I'm learning because it's such a vast continent with so much talent in every industry that you can imagine, whether it's fashion, technology, um, digital art, uh, the NFTs, you know, it's growing very quickly, and we're hoping to work closely with um, these artists and to take our own um, successful experiences or know-hows to
to Africa through partnerships, because nothing like this works unless you have local partners. So I'm looking for you to guide me on where <laughs> to look in Africa, but I think October will be an exciting moment with the Fashion for Relief, because I know Naomi's curating a whole event with music, fashion, photography, design, objects, uh, to showcase the African continent. Coming back uh, with the few minutes that we have left uh, in this conversation to the World Cup, uh, what is it that you hope people uh, take in? Uh, what is it that you hope to export to the world in terms of what Qatar is, what Qatar represents, and what, and what art and creativity is and, and how it unifies us? Well, I, I think we're trying to show the, 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 um, the diversity of the Arab world, but also we want people to experience Qatar as it really is. You know, there's been such a negative uh, press about Qatar, which is fairly inaccurate of people who've actually never been to Qatar. His Highness gave an amazing uh, talk at Davos most recently, specifically stating that many people have judged us without getting to know us. And the World Cup is a, is, a, is a great opportunity to celebrate people and celebrate our differences and bring people together to have conversations. Even if these conversations are difficult, even if these conversations we may disagree in or disagree on, it's really important that we use culture as a vehicle to bring people together and to find common interests. And so I'm really uh, you know, hopeful and um, excited that the world will be coming to Qatar for the World Cup, but also learning something about our culture that perhaps they didn't know or didn't understand before that. And finally, would you like to leave us with something that we can take away, a most important thought or a final thought that uh, we can consider uh, as we conclude the interview and almost at the close of the forum? So I think, you know, as you see or experience the various programs that we'll be offering in the fall, we also have um, a movement festival and a fashion and, and music show between the semifinals and the finals, is to just keep an open mind and come to us with your ideas or come to us with your um, proposals, whether, they're, whether um, we can do them or not is a different uh, discussion, but we're very open. You know, we, I've had so many different people, unexpected people come through with ideas that at first we thought could never materialize, but then they've been the best uh, initiative that we've taken forward. So the message is we're open to the world and we want the world to be um, embracing and respectful to our cultures and understand the roots of, of tradition and why we do certain things the way we do. And we're open for a conversation. Your Excellency, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.